Daniel chapter 2 and we are going to continue from where we left off last week, last Saturday. Now, we have already seen that in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel is a team man, especially in verse 36, he gives the right kind of credit for how the prayer was answered by God. Amen. It's nice to see that and it's nice for us to learn from this one man. Now, we have also seen up to verse 43 that the last kingdom or the fourth kingdom is going to be an important kingdom. Amen. It's going to be an important kingdom because there will be no fifth kingdom. At the same time, this fourth kingdom has more spoken about it than the first three. I've already shared with you about how the four kingdoms, I'll repeat it again, the head of gold represents the Babylonian kingdom, the breast and the arms of silver represent the Medo-Persian empire, the belly and the thighs of brass represent the Greek empire, and the legs of iron represent the empire of Rome. And you will find the feet is mixed with iron and clay. It's talking about the last form of the Roman rule. Now, I shared with you about how we are living in the time of the fourth kingdom today. Just like Daniel lived in the time of the Babylonian kingdom and then looked a little bit into the Medo-Persian empire also. He was one man who was unique. Because his ministry spanned two world empires. It's amazing how God will fulfill in a man's lifetime what he said he will do. Amen. Praise God. Now, I shared with you about how this legs of iron represent the Roman Empire and the feet which is having clay inserted into the iron is the last form of the Roman Empire. What we are really looking at is this image represents the futile efforts of a man to somehow dominate this world by his own efforts. That's why it's like an image. Nebuchadnezzar is seeing an image. So this is a typological representation of how man is futile in his efforts to be world ruler. If you want to be a world ruler, then you must rule the world depending on God's Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And that kind of a, ro that kind of a rule has no parallel with the earthly way of ruling. In fact, that kind of a rule is completely different from the worldly rule that you will see. The worldly rule of a man is to glorify himself, his efforts. Whereas the rule by the Spirit of God that a man begins to have, which you have and I have as born again Christian believers today, is a complete projection of the one who lives on the inside of us. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, we are looking at deterioration from one kingdom to another. That is revealed through the image in several ways. And I am going to give you the ways so you can write them down. There are five ways in which you see this deterioration in the world empires mentioned. Number one. We see this deterioration mentioned in the quality of the metals. Gold, silver, brass, iron. Then, number two. 
even in the natural the specific gravity of the metals show deterioration gold is one of the purest of the metals that you see there and there's a little bit of mixture in the rest so the gravity of the metals also show deterioration number 3 the position of the metals the head has more honor than the feet has number 4 the specific statement of scripture that you will read in daniel chapter 2 verse 39 it says and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee mark it down please so god himself declares that the kingdoms that follow the babylonian empire will be inferior and fifthly the division of sovereignty denotes weakness i'll explain that the division of sovereignty denotes weakness now what do we mean by that now nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold just one but after that we find there is a division medio persian empire represented by two arms then so nebuchadnezzar's empire is strong only one monarch total monarchy there is no other person no division but when it comes to the second empire there is division medio persian empire then the four, third empire the greek empire was divided into four the west was taken by cassander c a s s a n d e r cassander one of the generals of alexander thank you cassander took the west of greece the western empire the northern one went to lysimachus l y s i m a c h U S Lysimachus The eastern one went to Seleucus S E L E U C U S Seleucus and the southern one went to Ptolemy It's written as P T O L E M Y The P is silent So Ptolemy now these four generals split the empire after alexander died a premature death okay he was a drunkard for your information so his death was a premature one and uh, here you find that his empire was split okay and then the final one is rome has two legs of iron but it eventuates into 10 toes which are composed of both iron and clay so there are five ways in which from the image you understand that every one of the empires that follows the babylonian empire was inferior to the babylonian empire now in this place we see that there is a stone that is not cut with hands okay verse 34 it smites the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay what is this representing now it's representing god's form of government god's form of government is never a democracy you may write it down we think that god's form of government will surely have a committee maybe there'll be a committee maybe there'll be people who will sit and decide there won't be anybody who will decide god will give the orders hallelujah and that's how it's going to be it is never a democracy 
That's why anything that God does is never democratic. He doesn't come and ask you a question. What do you say about, you know, going and ministering in such and such a place? He doesn't sit and ask for our opinions. He just says, I have commanded that you will go on such and such a day there and finish my work. That's it. Period. As far as he is concerned, it's done in his mind. Well, if you move away from that plan, you will have what Jonah had. All hell will break loose. But if you follow his plan, then you'll find the blessing of the Lord will back what he asked you to do. Hallelujah. If you look at Jonah's life, sometimes people get to think that God didn't honor Jonah. They're wrongly mistaken in their presumption and their final conclusion that God did not honor jo Jonah. If you read carefully, you will find that God honored the message of Jonah. Hallelujah. And that's what God has called you and me to do. He didn't sit and ask us to see whether the leg grew. The leg growing out or the hands growing out or the eyes popping open is his business. Hallelujah. What's our duty is for us to preach the word in season and out of season. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what we need to understand. Jonah was more, you know, banking on the end result. That was not his business. That was the prerogative of God. Destruction was promised by God upon Nineveh. And if God chose to honor those people's humility and repentance, then that was his business, not Jonah's business. Amen. Let's get our theology right this morning. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, Jonah, poor man, he went and spoke and God didn't honor Jonah. God honored the message Jonah preached. That is why Nineveh repented. And if they didn't repent, all hell would have broken loose in Nineveh. But because they heard and obeyed, then God did what he said he will do. When he said, if a man will turn away from his sin and come unto me, I will in no ways cast him out. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. So we are looking at this from Daniel. God's form of government is never democratic. Never. But when he speaks... It has only one ruler and that one ruler will be this rock or this stone that is cut without hands. Meaning, no man will have any place to lay a claim on that stone. I did it. Or I fashioned him. Oh, he is the labor of my hands. This is a stone that is not cut with hands. Hallelujah. Cut out without hands. Okay. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because his government will be a theocratic government. He will be Lord of Lords. King of Kings. And there will be absolute kingship given to him. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar. He was small king of kings. Small letter K. But when it comes to Jesus. All will point to him as being supreme king. Hallelujah. With a capital K. So you must understand how Daniel is choosy even about the words he is speaking before this king. In verse 37. Thou art a king of kings. Small k. Okay. Now, let's look again at this fifth, I mean the fourth empire. I told you that we are living in the time of the fourth empire. This may amaze us, but that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Briefly. There is no great world power that will follow the Roman Empire. In fact, it will be the last one. And it will be in existence in the latter days. That's the days we are living in. That's the days people are saying Jesus will come again. This stone that is cut out without hands will come. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And this Roman Empire, even though it fell apart, no enemy destroyed it. You must understand this also. The Roman Empire was not destroyed by an enemy. It just fell apart. And that's why you find traces of the Roman Empire even there today. No one defeated Rome when Rome was standing. But Rome just fell apart. 
There were so many other reasons that historians give why Rome fell apart. But there was no one enemy that came up against Rome and prevailed against them. And therefore this form of Rome or the Roman form of ruling still lives on. I'll give you examples for this. Rome still exists in the great nations of today. Rome still exists in the great nations of today. Example, Europe. Europe. Most of the European nations were at one time under Rome. They made up the Roman Empire. Italy, France, Great Britain, Germany, Spain were all part of the Roman Empire. I'll go over it again. If you're writing, please write. Italy, France, Great Britain, Germany and Spain. Now you'll begin to understand why there is so much of interest in the European Union coming together. In fact, all the nations have come together except Great Britain. Except Great Britain, all the nations have come together. But there is some hesitancy still on the part of Great Britain to join Europe and to have one currency. Okay, but so we can understand we are living in very, very close to the last days. Okay, we are living in last days. Now, number two, the laws of Rome live on and so does her language. The laws of Rome live on and so does her language. If you will study history or if you will look into some of these archives that they delve in and you know take out material that related to the Second World War, you will find that Germany and Italy adopted so much of their policies and everything that they believed in from the Roman Empire. Now, for example, the way they ruled. Hitler and Benito Mussolini ruled like dictators. They were wanting world power. That's why they wanted to bring the nation together. What you hear is the World War II from, you know, people who talk about it and who, you know, write about it. Sometimes we have elders who have lived through the war times. What we call the World War II was an attempt by these men to bring the nations of the world into world control under one ruler. Okay? That's number one. Number two, they adopted the insignia. They will march like the Romans. If you look at any of these, you know, German war archive uh, footage which they show on television I would like you to please look at it the way they march the way they salute it the way they will cry out hail hail Hitler all these were adopted straight from Roman ways of ruling very harsh why were more than 3 million Jews or 4 million Jews just sent to the gas chambers they could not stand anybody else any threat to them, personal security was dealt with in a very, very harsh manner. So, it's very necessary for us to understand that the way this kind of ruling still lives on in these nations. It's still there. In fact, the other day I was speaking to an sister and she was telling me, Pastor, I'm sure you know the Antichrist must be around. I said, yeah, he's around. I believe it firmly because if we are talking about end times, he's somewhere. He's just waiting to spring up at the right time. He's biding his time. But that man will be possessed by Satan himself. He will be so unclean and so evil that he will, you know, not be just possessed by a few demons. He'll be possessed by Lucifer himself. Because he's going to deceive the entire world. So, the laws of Rome live on and her language also. Why do we say language? Sometimes people say, they speak English in this place, they speak something else in another place. What do you mean by language? Listen. No one speaks Latin today, the language of Rome. 
but it is basic to understanding French, Spanish and other languages. So those of you who learn French, you can know that you have a background. French, Spanish and other languages all come from, you know, a basic understanding of Latin, whether it's grammar or whether it's words. Even in English you have words that come from Latin. Okay. Then, her warlike spirit lives on, always at war. Rome was always at war with everyone. And Europe today has been at war ever since it broke up into these many nations and kingdoms. They're always fighting. It's always a war. Either it's a war of, you know, armies marching on or it's an economic war. Some war with somebody. If you know, if you take uh, an inventory of what is happening in NATO, what's happening in NATO, all the European forces are there. UN, European forces. So they are at war always. So her warlike spirit, you must understand it's an unclean spirit. It's dominating these people. Because they may, you know, bring up legitimate reasons. They may say, no, we are, you know, guarding the boundaries of our land or we are trying to, you know, fight against democracy, I mean, fight against people who are against democracy and so many things. But behind all of this, the warlike spirit of this Roman Empire is dominating these nations. Okay? And I've written here, much Europe is steaming to form a unified U Europe with one currency, the Euro. Man called the Antichrist or the man of sin will someday come to put the Roman Empire back together again. When will it happen? Well, all this will happen when God removes his people called the church from this earth. Now, what you may think is just a, you know, after all, we got to believe that the church goes. Is a doctrine that not too many believers believe in. They have so many questions about this one teaching. Will the church really go? Because the church today is so wealthy. What is going to purge the church? Will the church really be taken before the, you know, antichrist rule or will God permit the church to go through the rule of the antichrist so that the church will be purged? My friends, the Bible tells us that the church will be taken. Hallelujah. Loud Amen, please. The church will be taken. And there's no reason for us to believe that God is going to send us through the rule of the Antichrist. It's very, very clear. So, when the Antichrist is revealed, the church will not be on planet Earth. We will be with the Lord in the air, waiting for the time when we should come again. Okay? So many have attempted to put the Roman Empire back together. Because the timing has not been right, it has not come to pass. Hitler tried it, he committed suicide and died. Benito Mussolini tried it, he was caught, killed, hanged upside down with his mistress on the very streets where he thought he would rule and reign. Then there have been others who have tried it over and over again, through various me ways and means. But they have never succeeded in somehow trying to put the Roman Empire back again because that has been, play I mean, that one act will be fulfilled when the Antichrist comes to rule. I've written a couple of, you know, people have tried to put it back together. The Roman Catholic Church, for one, has tried it at the beginning. If you study church history, you will know what I am talking about. They have tried to exercise dominion over this entire earth through religious ways and by political means also. But it didn't work out. In fact, when they thought they had complete sway, that was the time we find that there was a breakaway in England and the Church of England was started. So, 
the Roman Catholic Church tried it at the beginning. Then Charles Magan, the emperor of Rome, tried it. He tried to make Christianity a world religion, which was not what God asked him to do. And he thought to do it by the sword. Amen. God's way is not by the sword. God's way is by the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. Not by the earthly sword. Napoleon tried it. I like you to write these pe people down so when you next time read something about them, you will begin to see the diabolic nature behind these men. There are times when you read about them and you feel very sad. My God, Napoleon, you know, banished to an island, living by himself, a broken man. Maybe he was just ambitious like some of these, you know, army generals are, but why did they behave with him in such a harsh way? But what you will read and note, you must note, is that this man was trying to establish one world control in his time. And he met his Waterloo, not at Waterloo, alone, but in Russia. Because they followed a policy of scorched earth policy, where they will burn, burn, burn their homes They'll kill their cattle, livestock, everything and retreat. And when they retreat, the harsh Russian winter dominates the entire countryside and the landscape. And the invaders have nothing to feed on. That's why it's called the scorched earth policy. Okay. Now, there were several emperors of Germany before the time of Hitler who tried it. That all of them failed. Why? Because God's timing has not yet come. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now let's continue. Verses 44 onwards. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king, what shall come to pass hereafter? And the dream is certain. And the interpretation thereof sure. Hallelujah. What confidence this one man has in what the Lord has spoken to him. He is not going back on what he said. He is clear about what he has heard. He is clear about, clear about the dream. He is clear also about the interpretation. So verses 44 and 45 is talking about the destruction of the Gentile world powers and the full establishment of the kingdom of heaven upon earth. What will be the end of the last kingdom? Iron mixed with clay. Well, you can write down. Clay rep represents the masses. Different nations of the ten toes. Okay. Iron speaks of the fact that Rome lives on in this form of the old empire. That's why iron and clay. Clay is talking about people. And you will find about the Antichrist mentioned in, in scripture. Where he is called by 35 different names. We are not going to go over those names now. But he has 35 different names, one of which is the Antichrist. You write it, the Antichrist with capitals. Sometimes people, out of some misplaced reverence for God's name, say, no, we will write it with small. No, it's talking about one man. There have been many Antichrists, you will read in the epistle of John, small a. But this man is referred to as the Antichrist. He is the final person who will rise up against God and everything godly. 
So he's talking about one man. And it's mentioned about him, he will be a world dictator in Revelation chapter 13. When Jesus comes, he will rule as a just autocratic ruler and he will crush all rebellion against him. Psalm 2 verse 9. Because the Antichrist will be walking in open rebellion against God. He will be there when Jesus comes. Let's read Psalm 2 verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So that scripture is referring to the work of Jesus. How he is going to come and establish his autocratic rule in this world. And how he will crush all rebellion. Matthew 21, 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That's the stone that you find in Daniel. Sometimes we use it to talk about anyone trying to rebel against God and his works today. But you will find this understandable for you when you look at Daniel. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's what will happen, Daniel said, to the kingdoms of the Gentiles. It will become like dust, powder. It will be scattered and you will never see it again. Whereas this stone will grow into a big mountain. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of God's kingdom will be Jesus Christ. Amen. It will be Him and Him alone. He will be the stone against whom no world empire will prosper. So when he comes, there will be no more any Gentile ruling. Okay, So he is our place of rest. He talks of Christ in his office as both Savior and Judge. And mark it down. That's why the stone. He is Savior and Judge. He is the rock of salvation, Deuteronomy 32.15. The rock from which water flowed when Moses struck it once. Plus he is the rock of judgment, Deuteronomy 32.43. See it's mentioned that the Jezurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, Deuteronomy 32.15. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Then Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 43. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries. And will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Hallelujah. During the Antichrist rule, much will be done against God's people. So the same rock of salvation will also stand as the rock who will be our judge. There will be much evil perpetrated against Israel, God's people, in the natural. Much harm. Many will die through bloodshed. Even now if you will notice... The war in Afghanistan, no one's bothered about people being killed. They keep talking about terrorists, 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 terrorists. But they're not bothered about the civilians who are getting killed. They're not bothered about the children getting killed. It will be no different when the Antichrist comes, believe me. He will have nations backing him. He will have armies backing him. His word, they will go and kill. They will slaughter people by the thousands. They may call it by different names at that time. They may call it rebellion. They may call it anarchy. They may call it something to justify the way in which they are going. But one thing is certain. The Bible says when the Antichrist comes, those seven years will be terror-stricken days for people on this earth who don't go 
after what he says. Anyone who doesn't follow him will have to pay with their lives. It's going to be very dangerous. So in Daniel, it talks of Christ coming to the earth as judge to put down earth's rebellion against God. It's a reference to the second coming of Christ to the earth. Not the rapture. The second coming of Christ to the earth. Revelation 19 verses 11 to 21. Last week, speaking to dear sister, she said, I was surprised when I heard on television them saying there will be two comings of Christ. And I thought it was blasphemy. Then we came for the fasting prayer the next day. And there you were saying that it's true. There will be two comings. The first one will be in the air. When Jesus comes to take the church, it will be a secret coming. Nobody will see it. The second coming, which we see referred to in Daniel, will be a visible coming. Everybody will see him. In fact, when he comes, there will be a, such a loud trumpet blowing. And he will put his leg on the Mount of Olives and is going to split in two. Hallelujah. Okay, let's read Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11 onwards to verse 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white, fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it, it he should smite the nations. Mark the dung, that phrase. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Like we see in Psalm 2 verse 9. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. That you may eat the flesh of kings. There will be a lot of death on that day. The flesh of captains, commanders of armies, generals, lieutenant generals, colonels. And the flesh of mighty men. And the flesh of horses. And of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free and born, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So that's the kind of attitude that man will have. Who's this Jesus? Let's kill him. Let's finish him up. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So who's going to jump into the lake of fire and brimstone first? The Antichrist and the false prophet. They are the first guests who are going to enter there. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It will happen literally, I believe. This is not some picture. <laughs> like sometimes people like to believe the book of Revelation. Maybe it's some picture. It will happen really. Thank God we are going to see it and we are going to rejoice. That time we won't feel sad. 
because we will be so filled with Jesus and the things of Jesus that when we see sin and evil, we will rejoice that Jesus is putting down all rebellion against God. Hallelujah. They won't sit and tell Jesus, Jesus, poor thing, don't do it. Please. That's a poor child. She doesn't know or he doesn't know Christ. Instead, you will find that we will rejoice with him. Hallelujah. And thank him for all his mercies in finally answering the prayer of the saints. And establishing the kingdom of God on this earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now. You can write it down. Three things. His coming is going to be. Climatic. Catastrophic. And cataclysmic. Cataclysmic. Okay, three things. Climatic, catastrophic, and cataclysmic. That's right. Cataclysmic. Reference. We're going to read all these references now. Sometimes we never turn to these parts of the Bible. Zechariah. It's after Haggai and between Malachi. Easy to find. That's just before the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 14 verses 1 to 3. Behold the day of the Lord cometh. And the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses rifled. It's an unusual word. Okay. And the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And in verse 4 you see his, this, this is the prophecy he was saying. How Christ's feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And his feet shall stand in the day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. Talk about implosion. And there shall be a very great valley. We can write it down. Today when they saw WTC crumbling down, we heard for the first time that word mentioned everywhere. Oh, it's imploding. It's imploding. We have heard of exploding, but we never heard really that word imploding being used so often. Now this is going to be an implosion. It's going to become a valley and half the mountain shall remove towards the north and half of it towards the south. Okay? So climatic, catastrophic and cataclysmic. Next reference, Joel. Please write down these references. It will help you when you talk to others about the coming of Christ and you live also with an expectancy Joel chapter 2 uh, chapter 3 please verse 2 Joel chapter 3 verse 2 and then we'll read from verse 9 onwards to verse 16 I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Then verse 9 onwards. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Mark that down. Among the Gentiles, prepare war, 
Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. It's already happening. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. That's why I told you the second coming of Christ is going to be climatic, catastrophic and cataclysmic. There will be shaking that will take place. There will be things that will happen when Jesus comes again. He will come. But the Lord will be the hope of his people. Amen. And the strength of the children of Israel. Next reference, Isaiah. Chapter 34, verses 1 to 8. Isaiah 34, verses 1 to 8. Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken you people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. And their stink shall come out of their carcasses. And the mountain shall be melted with their blood. That's how the bloodshed will be. Terrible. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Okay, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. That means this world will not be destroyed by nuclear weapons. The church can be cocksure about it. Sometimes you have people wondering whether they'll drop this bomb and that bomb. My friends, this world, even if they drop 10 anthrax bombs, this world is not going to be destroyed by anthrax. Amen. Lord, Amen, please. Believe what we are saying. This world is going to wait for what Christ said will happen. Hallelujah. We are not talking about the unrealities of what is happening in this world. Well, they are real. The threats are real. The terrorist threats are real. But this world will not be destroyed by terrorism. That's what we are reading here. For my sword shall be baked in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bosra. The word Bosra is the word Petra or Petra. It's the capital of Edom. And this place features in end time prophecy. Please write it down. It's a very, very important place. And a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with blood. They are thus made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. The year of recompenses 
for the controversy of Zion. And finally, the last reference is Psalm 2, the entire Psalm. Please, let's read that. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hallelujah. It's nice to have scriptures that deal with healing and deliverance and faith spoken from the pulpit. It's also necessary for us to believe in prophecy also. That it will happen. But sometimes we get so caught up with the world and the things that happen around us. We wonder, can it really take place? Will God really do this? Well, the good news is he will really do what he says he will do. Hallelujah. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh and the Lord shall have them in derision. If you have questions about God laughing, well, mark it down there. He laughs. He laughs at the confusion of man. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Okay, verse 7. Those of you who don't know, I'm just mentioning it. It's talking not about the birth of Jesus Christ. Because there are people who have read Psalm 2 verse 7 and thought this day have I begotten thee to mean Jesus was begotten on a particular day. It's not talking about that. It's talking about resurrection. It's talking about the day he became the first fruit from the resurrection or the dead. So you note it down because we have groups of people who will sit and argue with you that Jesus was made on a particular day. One group is the Jehovah's Witness. So that's why they don't believe in Jesus and give him equal status with God the Father, whom they call Jehovah. This is the place that causes people to stumble. This day have I begotten thee. So there was a point of time when Jesus came into existence. The Bible doesn't teach us that Jesus came into existence. The Bible tells us he was there with the Father from eternity past. Hallelujah. He has no beginning. He has no ending. So verse 7 is talking about resurrection day when Jesus was begotten from the dead. Amen. Thank you. Verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And you perish from the way. And his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Sometimes people don't know where the son was mentioned in the Old Testament. He was mentioned but they didn't have a revelation of it. They didn't know what they were prophesying under the inspiration of God's spirit. That's where you find mention is of the son. God's giving him great importance. If you kiss the son, he will not be angry. You don't kiss the son, you are in big trouble. Lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. This is only a little that we are going to be seeing when he comes again. Then imagine how much it is going to be if he really loses his temper like we have. You know, phrases that we use when we lose our temper. We lost our temper. It says, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So God is going to end man's little day down here and establish his eternal kingdom. It's going to be a time when there will be thousand years 
of rain called the millennium, the golden era that man is craving for, when the lion will lie down with the lamb, when the young child will put his hand or her hand into the cockatrice's den. That means you see the cockroach, you won't jump. You see the lizard, you won't run a hundred meter race. That will be a time of no fear. Nothing. It will be a time of great peace where Christ and He alone will be Lord and Master. That will be the thousand years reign, the millennium. And the earth will be tested under the personal reign of Christ. With that we are going to close this morning. That's what will happen during the thousand year reign. Well, pastor, what will we do at that time? Well, what you will do and I will do is what we are singing every day in the praise and the worship. That's why we tell you, please open your mouths and sing. <laughs> Throughout all eternity, we are going to worship Him and reign with Him. Amen. Well, be found faithful. At least then you will get some kingdoms to rule over. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Be found faithful. Worship the Lord. When you see these songs put up on the OHP, don't think of this Pastor Isaac song or some song from America. These are songs that declare our faith and our belief in the things that are not seen with the natural eyes, but which will come to pass. Hallelujah. It will come to pass. 